Hello, this is the Stephen Harriet Show by Catholic Vote, and I'm Stephen Harriet. So this week, there's been so much hubbub about immigration. It's been mostly loudmouth commentary from both left and right that I think in many, many cases really misses the mark when it comes to the crisis on the border. First of all, of course, you've heard about the separation of children from families on the border. This uh, has been largely uh, a media-driven outcry about a problem that is much deeper than they let on. Now, I want to give you, our viewers, a really good idea of what's going on policy-wise. For that aspect of everything, I'm going to defer directly to Catholic Vote itself. Now, since I'm a subscriber to Catholic Vote's emails, and I subscribe to The Loop by Catholic Vote, which you can subscribe to as well by going to catholicvote.org slash loop, I'm extremely up-to-date on what the technical uh, details of what's going on are. But in addition to that, this is something I've been paying attention to for some time, and in my research, I've generally discovered something that is really underreported, which is that there is a massive human rights crisis happening on the border and especially south of the border, and that that crisis is almost entirely ignored, not necessarily by reporters, but certainly by commentators and pundits, again, both left and right. So before I delve directly into Catholic Vote's own statements and the statements of Catholic Vote President Brian Birch, which I will actually read to you because you stupidly haven't subscribed yet. I don't know what's wrong with you. Uh, Before I get into that, I want to just give you a really quick idea of what is at stake in the border debate because not enough people are talking about it. So I've got some notes right here. I'm actually going to just read directly off of my notes. Now, for decades now, and especially, I think, exacerbated by the last two presidencies, there has been a sort of bureaucratization uh, on the border, which has almost suspended or replaced actual law. Law enforcement on the border has been frustrated in many ways by not necessarily law, but policy and practice changes that have really made it an insecure border. And, of course, actually the past three presidents have overtly admitted that there's a problem on the border. Barack Obama himself even said that there's a big problem with insecurity on the border. It's just that he dealt with in a very feckless and ineffective way. Long story short, with an insecure border and with particularly the catch-and-release policy that you've probably heard about, where virtually anyone can walk into the country and claim asylum after being caught as an illegal immigrant. Oh, I'm just here to claim asylum. Since that's been happening, word has spread south of the border that virtually anyone can walk into the country, and that through catch-and-release, which is where you claim asylum, they bring you in and the court assigns you a court date and says, we'll talk to you in a month and a half, right? You just never show up to your court date. Uh, More on that later, and Brian Birch really gets into that uh, in his letter. But the point is, word spread, and who took advantage of the word spreading that we had an insecure border? Cartels and human traffickers and other violent criminals south of the border. And who do they take advantage of? Migrants, particularly illegal migrants, whom they promise safe passage to the U.S. And in fact, oftentimes, what the cartels or other human smugglers will do is they'll tell people, hey, pay us $5,000 to drop you off in the U.S. territory so that you can successfully illegally immigrate to the U.S. But if you don't pay us, go ahead and try your luck on your own, and you'll probably get killed or raped, wink, wink, by us. So again, just to, get, just to show you the weight of what's going on and what's at stake here. Rape. According to a 2014 study by Fusion, a full 80% of women and younger girls were being raped crossing from Mexico to the U.S. In some cases, the report revealed sex is taken by Mexican smugglers and guides as a form of payment from poor girls who have no other means of getting passage to the U.S. Other girls are tricked or forced into prostitution in Mexican towns and never make it to the U.S. at all. Labor and sex trafficking. As NBC News reported earlier this year, the Trump administration's Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services Departments all pooled their resources into the Blue Campaign. The Blue Campaign is a program that is designed to address the problem of human trafficking. And what they found was not pretty. Between September 30th, 2015 and August 30th, 2016, 508 human trafficking victims were reported, according to Polaris's data. Polaris is a partner with the Blue Campaign. 
Of those, the majority of victims were female adults of Mexican nationality. Most people taken across the border, 49%, were trafficked for the purposes of labor trafficking. Sex trafficking made up another 46%. Polaris' data also said the majority of traffickers were male adults of Mexican nationality. Death and murder. Migrants die on the U.S.-Mexico border almost daily. Citing U.N. data, the Washington Post reported this year that over 7,200 migrants died crossing the border from Mexico since 1998, or about 1,500 more than the number of U.S. troops killed in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And not all of these deaths are accidents. In 2010, for example, 72 illegal immigrants were murdered all at once by members of the Los Zetas drug cartel in what became known as the First San Fernando Massacre. It's called the First because it happened again in 2011. The second time, there were 193 victims, all later found in mass graves. And just a quick note, for those who do succeed in immigrating to America illegally, getting caught, being given an asylum hearing and then never show up to their (laughs) asylum hearing uh, in the courts and just go north and get rid of their ankle bracelet and escape into the U.S., what's the prospect for them, right? The best case scenario, yay, you've made it. You've illegally immigrated to the U.S. Consider what my friend Jason Jones, the human rights activist, calls the underground economy. If you are an illegal immigrant and you get a job because you got to get a job, what happens is you're working in conditions where you have no recourse to America's laws that are there for the protection of workers. So you can't demand the minimum wage. You can't demand fair treatment. You can't demand not to work uh, you know, 90 hours a week. Hell, if you get raped by your boss, you're probably not going to report it. What are you going to do? You're going to go to the police. And you know what? You complain to your boss, and the boss says, what do you want me to do? You want me to tell ICE? I mean, this is an abusive, this is just an incredible grounds for abuse in the U.S., even after the successful illegal immigration of migrants, the, the, the prospects are not good. It's not the best case scenario. Best, of course, would be if everyone were to immigrate legally. And the only way to have that happen is to have an orderly immigration system and a secure border. So now that you have a little bit of a picture of the mass slaughter, the mass rape and sexual violence and the human trafficking going on at the border, You might have a little more sympathy for efforts, however clumsy, on the part of the Trump administration to curtail the chaos on the border. You know, almost everything you hear of in mainstream commentary as being anti-migrant is actually anti-Mexican thugs who kill migrants. So stop buying all of that propaganda. The idea of open borders being anything but chaos and abuse has to be dispelled with. And in fact, right-wing commentators, their rhetoric is useless. It's unconvincing, and it sounds dehumanizing. Oh, we need to have secure borders so that we can keep migrants away from us because they're awful people is not helpful. What is helpful is saying, let's look at the most uh, under threat in this scenario. Who are the people suffering the worst? Well, it's migrants themselves. And you know why? Because our border is not secure. If it were secure... We would not have these cottage industries of cartels and people smugglers built all along the border, which are designed and and based around an insecure border. We basically feed uh, murderous uh, criminals who kill and rape migrants more than anyone else. We feed their business by having an insecure border. They have based their cruel and their abusive business on our insecurity. Now, getting back to what's going on on the border now— like I said, for specific policy things, I want to refer you directly to Catholic Vote. Here's an email I got from my boss, Brian Birch, just yesterday. This is an email that you would get if you went to catholicvote.org slash loop and sign up for our newsletters. And it's really valuable stuff. It keeps you up to date. The loop, all this week, practically every story every day has been about immigration, every detail you might want to know. This is more of a statement. This is a statement about uh, President Trump signing an executive order to keep families together at the border. So this is the letter from Brian Birch, president of Catholic Vote. Moments ago, President Trump signed an executive order. The order makes clear that family unity is a priority at the border. We fully support the president's action. The border must be secured. Our laws must be enforced. But the family must always take precedence. Of course, a permanent legislative fix would have been better. Just yesterday, Senator Ted Cruz proposed legislation that would have ended family separation, provided temporary housing facilities, and doubled the number of immigration judges so that cases could be processed faster. 
But before the ink was even dry on Senator Cruz's proposal, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer made clear Democrats would oppose Cruz's bill. In essence, they admitted they would rather the border crisis continue and focus on Trump instead. Keep in mind the Cruz bill was clean, meaning it had a laser focus on the family separation policy. No funding for a border wall, no E-Verify, nothing on DACA. And Democrats still said no way. Here's the crux. Since the establishment of an immigration policy called the Flores Settlement in 1997, our laws have prevented children illegally crossing our border from being held in detention centers for more than 20 days. With the surge in those claiming asylum, the backlog of cases became impossible to resolve within 20 days. So the Obama administration decided to release the parents and the children into the United States pending a future court hearing, a practice commonly called catch and release. Yet, according to the Heritage Foundation, 95% of asylum claimants never show up to their court hearing. And according to reports, as many as 80% of asylum claims, these are the people who do show up for court, are denied as illegitimate. The Trump administration decided instead to hold all adult illegal migrants in custody to prevent asylum claimants from fleeing. But still bound by the Flores settlement, the administration was forced to separate children after 20 days to the Department of Health and Human Services, to find them a responsible guardian with preference for relatives. So what does the new executive order do? The order, one, states that the policy of the government is to rigorously enforce our nation's immigration laws, but also to prioritize family unity as much as possible. Two, instructs the Secretary of Homeland Security to provide facilities to accommodate these families together for longer than 20 days. Three, instructs the Attorney General to petition the federal courts to modify the Flores Settlement to allow families to be held together for more than 20 days because of the current limitations of our immigration courts to handle the surge in cases. This executive order is the right call. But the partisan propaganda and media hype we've watched over the past several days make clear that the good of migrant children and their families was often not the real goal. The comparisons to the Holocaust, the phony pictures of kids in cages taken not from the border but from a protest, the total media blackout on what occurred in the past, the references to concentration camps and the insinuation that the only reason for the policy was racism and hatred was downright despicable. These children deserve better than to be used in a partisan war by supposedly educated people, some of whom are Catholic. The letter goes on from there, but man, that is good stuff. That is exactly the right attitude to have. First of all, put family first, Put the immigrants themselves first. That's what's at stake. We're talking about mass murder. We're talking about an absolute human rights crisis on the border that's been going on forever, and much of which has been going on and worsening under the Obama presidency. When the Trump administration makes any efforts to bring security to that border and to lessen the number of people attempting the border crossing and risking their lives and the lives of their children, that's a good thing. In fact, the moral onus is on people who scream and yell and use all this thunderous moral language against the Trump presidency really just to get at the Trump presidency because they're angry and they're partisan. The onus is on them to explain why do you want to continue to empower cartels and human traffickers and sex predators on the border. Explain why you want the status quo to continue or worsen. Why do you want insecurity? Why do you want migrants dead? That is what the policies you're calling for will lead to and will perpetuate. So stop yelling at people who want border security and calling them Nazis, and instead take a look in the mirror. Think about what you could do to better understand the plight of migrants and what policies you could back, whether they're from a Republican or not, even if you hate the people who author the policies. What policies could you back that might alleviate the pain of migrants on the border? This is the Stephen Harriet Show by Catholic Vote, the show that's always truthful and almost never prudent. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet.